Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Make Design Matter talk. I am happy to see the room full once again. So thank you for the ones who are returning, and welcome for the ones who are here first time, and I hope to see you in the future talks. So Make Design Matter talks are a monthly series of talks that um, Article 25 is hosting uh, with the support of BRE Trust. And we aim to create a platform to talk about humanitarian architecture and uh, great projects uh, with social impact. So I'm going to talk a bit about Article 25. So Article 25 is an architectural charity and that we focus on delivering design solutions for vulnerable communities. And we specialize in healthcare projects and uh, education projects. And also we specialize in capacity on the ground. So as a small charity, we heavily rely on donations. So if you do feel like supporting us, please do. Um, big or small, all donations are more than welcome. I'm Julia, and I'm volunteer at Act 45 as an architecture assistant. And uh, I can tell from my personal opinion that all support it's more than welcome. Um, back to the event. So tonight's talk will be delivered by Andrea Panizzo, um, who is a director at EVA Studios. And the talk will last approximately 35 minutes, followed by a panel of discussion with invited guests and a Q&A at the end. So just before I hand it over to Andrea, I'd like to thank you very much for HKS for providing us the space for tonight's event. And that's it, so please let's give a warm welcome to Andrea. Thank you. Um, let's see if this microphone works or not. Can you hear me yes. in the back as well? Yeah, I actually don't have a great relationship with microphone in general and tonight I've been filled up, I have two of these. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start my presentation with a symbolic date, 23rd of May 2007, which is also being called uh, the Urban Millennium. For the first time in human history, uh, there are more people living in cities rather than in a rural context. Uh, according to UN Habitat, by 2050, the world's population is expected to nearly double, and 7 in 10 people on a global scale will live in cities which makes urbanization the most transformative trend of the 21st century. To respond to the different set of challenges that come with urbanization, UN Habitat in October 2016 has organized uh, the Habitat 3, which, is, which was a five days long conference, uh, the outcome of which was the new Urban Agenda, an agreement uh, that aims at promoting sustainable and inclusive uh, urban growth. Uh, to focus on public space and public housing and to reclaim 30 to 50 percent of city space as a public space, which is very much in line with the goal 11 of uh, sustainable development goals. Among the different issues and challenges that it comes with urbanization, we can find urban growth, uh, increased number of uh, people living in informal neighborhood, climate change, exclusion and inequality and the upsurge in international migration. Today, there are nearly 70 million forcibly displaced people on a global scale, which makes this current migration crisis the largest since World War II. Uh, refugees and IDPs, inter internally displaced people, still prefer to live in cities to access uh, uh, the formal and informal economy. This is a picture of uh, Tempelhof Airport in Berlin uh, back in 2016, when it was partly used as a refugee camp. Uh, however, there are many refugees and, uh, um, and IDPs that live in uh, camps. Uh, this is a picture of Zatari uh, camp, uh, located in northern Jordan, a few kilometers away from the border with Syria, where at its peak in 2015 hosted over 80,000 Syrian refugees. This is uh, the Rohingya camp, uh, is a recent picture of the Rohingya camp in Bangladesh, uh, which is the largest in the world today with a population of nearly 600,000 people. That's Canaan, uh, located a few kilometers away from the Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, uh, which was started 
in 2010 in the aftermath of the earthquake as an IDP camp of a few hundred people. Today is a city of uh, 260,000 uh, residents. According to UNHCR, the average stay as a refugee is 17 years, and uh, refugee camps are to be considered the cities of tomorrow. And we can just take a, a look uh, back at history. This is the Shatila camp. Uh, it was back then located near the capital of Lebanon, Beirut, uh, established in 1948 uh, by UNHCR by, um, uh, in the aftermath of the first Arab-Israeli war. This is the same camp today. Uh, since then, uh, Beirut has, been, has grown exponentially, it has completely swallowed this former tent camp, which is now a seven uh, to nine stories uh, tall buildings neighborhood. Just a quick background about myself. I graduated in 2005 from the Polytechnic of Milano. Um, and for six years, I had the opportunity to work for renowned practices such as Benes Associates in London and Massimiliano and Doriana Fuxas in Rome. And I really had the opportunity to work on very high end projects. Um, but towards the end of 2010, I went through a personal and professional crisis and I really started asking myself if this is the type of career I really wanted to continue doing. So I took a break and, and at the end of the 2010, I moved to La Paz, um, Bolivia, where I um, worked as a volunteer for a local organization called Alalai, providing assistance to three children. And for me, it was uh, the first opportunity. Uh, it was the first time I actually uh, had the opportunity to, to experience uh, the um, consequences and the challenges that come with urbanization, including uh, change of family patterns, uh, exclusion and inequalities. And I started asking myself, what could be the potential role as an architect in this kind of context? So I, I moved back to Italy and after a few months I decided that the question was valid and it was uh, definitely needed to be further investigated. Therefore, I have accepted a job uh, by, offered by one of the Italian chapter of Architects Without Borders and I moved to Port-au-Prince, Haiti in 2011. was supposed to stay initially three months, then three months became six months, then six months became, don't ask me how, five years. Uh, really in Haiti I had uh, the opportunity again to understand a little bit better urbanization and the consequences of urbanization, including the increase of informality the increase of public poverty and the reduction of the provision of public goods. Uh, finally, in 2014, with a couple of friends, we started Emerging Vernacular Architecture, EVA Studio, uh, which is a London-based uh, designer research practice with still today an office in 18 Port-au-Prince and with a goal by the end of the year to start uh, an office in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. We are a team of seven including urban experts, designers and field engineers. We place people and places at the heart of our practice uh, philosophy. Initial research about uh, a specific community in a specific place allow us to understand the emergent processes, the vernacular methods that uh, are informed uh, design solutions that are culturally uh, appropriate and site specific. Uh, for us, architecture is as more than just a design. It's an inclusive process based on a bottom-up approach and uh, collabora collaborative efforts. And through different levels of community engagement, starting from the brief through the design and the construction phases and the final evaluation, we are now able to address the, the most urgent and pressing needs of a given community, but also to understand the potential and to explore the vision of, uh, of a given uh, community. Our work in Haiti, our Asian projects uh, uh, focus on public buildings and public spaces in four different informal neighborhoods, which includes uh, uh, a lot of public spaces, uh, also uh, those uh, for sport activities, a big uh, uh, public park, which is gonna be the largest urban park in Haiti, and public schools. Just to give you a little bit of context about Haiti, uh, in 83 in four people live in informal settlement. Uh, Kafufe, which is uh, one of the neighbors where we worked on for over three years, is located in the outskirts of uh, 80's capital, Port-au-Prince. Uh, it's characterized by an extreme poverty and by the lack of basic services such as water, 
sanitation and power. Uh, the urban fabric is quite dense, private space is predominant, and public space is reduced only to those necessary for circulation. Um, our work in Carrefour Fair consists in, in the design and construction of three public spaces, two of them dedicated to sport activities and one uh, public plaza, Tapiruj, I'm going to talk about that in a second. These three projects are part of a larger program financed by the American Red Cross, which is an integrated neighborhood uh, upgrade, which includes um, the retrofit of uh, housing, the provision of sanitation blocks, a major infrastructure, uh, street lights, and the upgraded uh, public realm. Uh, our three projects are not isolated, but are part of, uh, of uh, the upgrade net upgraded network of public streets and alleyways. This is a picture of Tapi Rouge just a few months after the earthquake in 2010, uh, when it was occupied as a tent camp of IDPs, as the earthquake really damaged uh, the majority of informal settlements in AT. Um, in 2012-2013, uh, th two or three years after the earthquake, uh, the emergency response phase ended and development projects started. Um, there was a great effort from the, all the different actors involved in the reconstruction to uh, not only improve people's lives, but also to improve the built environment. Build back better was the motto back, back then. Uh, however, for us, it was quite difficult to fit in as architect uh, to actually convince a client on, on the importance of having architectural and bringing architectural value in, in this kind of context. We're often seen as the decorators, almost like the unnecessary expense. So we had to be creative in the way we were approaching clients, approaching the different actors involved in the reconstruction. So we started engaging in a conversation with um, civic engineers and environmental engineers, especially in this case. Uh, in Plasta Perugia, the site was particularly prone to floods. So uh, we designed uh, the scheme, we modeled the scheme around concentric terraces uh, that follow the natural topography to reduce the cost of excavation. And uh, the center of the site, while well, the center of the site aims at collecting runoff water from the site and then connecting to an existing drainage channel, it also provides an aesthetic component and a social component as well. This is a gathering space, an amphitheater for 200 people, which is the largest in the neighborhood. Ultimately, with uh, Plasta Pirouge, we wanted to provide the residents and the community with the pleasure of the, a public piazza, almost like a communal living room for those that don't have a, communal, a living room in their own homes. We're talking about residents and entire families living in between 15 and 25 square meter homes. The architectural program includes an amphitheater, seating areas, green spaces, art installation, a water kiosk, and workout equipment. We work closely with the local labor, 75% of which come from the local community, really providing better quality and also a more joyful and more colorful environment, which is kind of different from the normally gray-like uh, uh, environment that you can find in informal neighborhoods. Uh, placemaking was not uh, only very important to, um, to provide the residents, with a sense of belonging and identity, but it was also important to trigger a sense of ownership. We have invited quite a few renowned artists from AT that for two weeks uh, worked together with the local community, especially the youth from the community, on a 150 meters long mural. And in AT, um, where it's very unlikely that the state or the local government has the, either the financial means or the uh, capacity to maintain these spaces and to collect the trash. Triggering a sense of ownership was actually quite key in the process. Uh, since its completion in 2016, we have run on a very slow uh, evaluation process to understand and to measure the impact of this public space in the neighborhood and in the community. The findings were quite interesting. The spaces were used, especially after dusk. Uh, we find out that the community um, set up a small committee that twice a week go on the public space and collect the trash, therefore the, the space is actually quite clean. And uh, there were other interesting factors that we, that, that we discover. There is a physiotherapist that provides services 
in the morning in the gym equipment, because normally it's more popular at night, to elderly. Or we find out that there are a couple of students, uh, university students, that they go to Place de Pirouge to actually find a quite easy way to study and uh, they're coming from other parts of the city. And for me, this is really interesting because it's a way that this small public space, this small project, is actually able to bridge the gap between the informal part and the formal part of the city. This is fun. Once a month, we receive from community members via WhatsApp pictures and flyers of what's going on in the public space, especially concert, uh, DJ sets, and parties. Our work in Lebanon uh, focuses on the reactivation of this missed public space in a particular uh, vulnerable area of Tripoli um, with the aim of fostering social inclusion between refugees and host population. Just to give you a little bit of context of the migration crisis in the Middle East, uh, Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon and Egypt took over 5 million uh, Syrian refugees since 2011. And the situation is particularly critical in the tiny country of Lebanon, with a tiny population of 6 million, 25% of the overall population is a refugee, including the Palestinian. Uh, in a context which has been really tricky and very challenging in the past few decades. The project is in Kobe, which is a neighbor located in what they call the poverty ring of Tripoli, second largest city located in the north of the country. And it, the project is within a uh, walking distance from Syria Street, which is like the line of demarcation and the Sitarian divide that separates uh, Tebane from uh, Jabal Mossen to uh, neighborhood, uh, respectively, uh, Sunni and Alawite. And it was also the theater of uh, recent uh, uh, clashes that ended at the beginning of 2015 almost like a spillover of the civic war in Syria into Lebanese territory. The population and the built environment in nearby uh, neighborhoods and areas were also affected. This is, these are a couple of pictures I took myself a year and a half ago. As you can see, there are bullet holes in the facades. Uh, and one of the consequences is that public space lie completely abandoned. So early 2018, we've been appointed by Solidarité Internationale, which is a French NGO, um, and to, uh, to the uh, rehabilitation of a public space uh, project, public stairs and smaller pocket spaces, um, funded by UNHabitat. And uh, the type of community engagement that we run together with the community engagement agents uh, from Solidarité was quite different from the one we used to do in Haiti. We had to divide the community in smaller groups, separating men from women at the beginning, and separating Lebanese from Syrians, uh, which in this particular uh, neighborhood count up to 70% of the overall population. The focus groups were, um, were taking place in Sabadis Garden, Sabadis apartment, on site, through tra transit and community walks, which helped us uh, mapping the most urgent needs and issues, such as drainage, and perception of safety, but also the initial suggestion on the design from the community. We have researched and we found this uh, beautiful and very interesting uh, local uh, technique called the uh, encaustic cement tires. It's a pressed tires, very colorful. It's actually, the process is actually quite, quite, quite amazing. It's actually quite known in Lebanon uh, for, they use it in the courtyards and the entrance halls of uh, houses of very well off uh, families. So we have worked together with the community to choose the pattern and, and we work a lot on the colors. And that's the design we proposed, which was validated by the community. And again, besides addressing the most pressing needs, drainage, perception of safety, uh, really the goal is providing this community with a more beautiful, safer, and more pleasant environment with the goal in mind to foster social inclusion between refugees and uh, Lebanese. In London, we are using the same approach of designing places for people. Um, since I moved back in 2016, we started uh, researching about the current housing shortage, uh, providing alternative solutions for affordable homes, as well as trying to understand what public space that it was designed and built in the past century uh, is performing today. 
It's actually quite common in London, in uh, existing modernist council estates, to find fenced and not accessible green areas or really underused or unused at all uh, public squares, which are normally just used for circulation or just used for walking through with a very little social value. So we start asking ourselves, what could public space look like in the 21st century? In the past uh, six uh, uh, months, we had the opportunity to actually uh, further investigate this question through a feasibility study that we have undertaken for Transfer for London ma Management Property. Um, TfL has been tasked with the ambitious program by the Mayor of London to deliver 10,000 homes by, uh, that needs to be on site by uh, March 2021. Uh, this is one of the many car parking owned by TfL next to the tube stations. We are in South Arrow. We've been asked to, um, to work on a feasibility study and an early concept design for 70 uh, residential units. So what we did instead of starting from the design of the, of the residential units, and uh, which normally ended up with a um, public space just being a landscape leftover space, uh, we really start working on a new typology of, uh, of a public space, completely flipping the logic here. So there are communal terraces and, uh, and uh, rooftops with a great overlook over the public space and the play space. Um, there is a step-free uh, communal alleyways for commuters from the tube, the tube station. Uh, there is a play space and there is a small pocket plaza, which is going to be used not only by the new residents, but also hopefully uh, by, the, uh, future, uh, by the current residents of the nearby area. Uh, South Arrow Place is a design concept which illustrates how previously underdeveloped sites can be unlocked through the use of precision manufactured housing and modern method of construction, MMC. Wo all walls and floors and ceilings are made out of CLT, cross laminated timber, and besides the benefit uh, of uh, faster delivery and higher build quality, uh, timber brings also, provides also a wonderful combo sink. Um, exactly a year ago, we have been appointed to the lot 3 of the ADOP2, the Mayor's London Architectural Design and Urbanist Framework, through which we have been recently appointed uh, for a project by Peabody in Tensmith, the rehabilitation of an existing public realm, and two parks, Collindale and Rushgrove Parks in Barnet. Last um, project I wanted to show you is a quick placemaking exercise we have done last year for the London Art Night in collaboration with Ben Judd, a Hackney based uh, artist. We've been asked by Ben to design geodesic domes in an existing um, council estate, Doddington and Rollo, located in Battersea. And um, so we start engaging with the housing association, with the community garden, uh, the, the people that, that were running the community garden. But they all told us that was a really difficult and challenging uh, community to engage with. So what we did is we distributed flyers saying, come at 11 o'clock on that Saturday on that specific spot and meet us there to start the construction of these uh, geodesic domes. Nobody showed up. So we thought they were right. Um, it's a very difficult uh, community to engage with. But the second we start rolling this very bright yellow carpet and we start building these geodesic domes, people start approaching, they were curious, they start asking questions. Uh, by the end of the day, after six hours of hard work in construction, we counted over 100 people. They were all residents of the estate. We, maybe we have counted the three or four people that were coming from uh, the uh, art night crowd. And for me, this is a quite an interesting uh, project to show you. Yes, it's a pop-up, it's just very temporary in nature, but people actually for once realized the potential of a, a very unused and underused space that was just used for circulation. Uh, in uh, October last year, the council has found some funds to actually redesign completely the, um, the square. Thank you. Good evening. 
I think this amplifies us and this gets us on video. <clears throat> so we'll need to, to use the both. You've already been introduced to Andrea. Thank you so much for such an informative and I wonder how many practices represented tonight have such a wide range of projects with a thread running through them like you have. So that was nourishing uh, and fantastic. Um, alongside me then I have Derek sitting who has recently started to work with Andrea and will explore that transition of, uh, of travel and places to projects in London a little bit in the discussion. Um, I'll ask Derek now to introduce what he does and uh, how he met Andrea. Yeah, hi, uh, Derek Wilson. First of all, thanks uh, for coming out to, to check this out. Um, was happy to join and, and see, uh, see Andrea's work. I mean, he's got a great portfolio and, and uh, you know, that's ultimately how we ended up getting to know each other. Um, we first met each other at, uh, at a charity event where we were clay pigeon shooting um, that I got sent to on my first week on the job. And, and since then, I've uh, come to lead the sustainable development team at TFL, uh, where we do a, a whole range of projects all the way up to you know, multi-thousand unit master plans and all the way down to the scale of small pilot projects. And that's you know, kind of where Andrea and I started collaborating. Um, I was really impressed with you know, the portfolio they put together and we brought him on, as he said, to do that feasibility study and, and we're continuing to work with each other on an ongoing basis, both in terms of uh, project development, design, and also starting to get into research. So uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be, be here and, and working with uh, Andrea. So thanks for, uh, for having us. It's all right, you can stay for a bit. <coughs> um, we've just known each other for less than an hour and uh, started having quite an interesting conversation um, about how wor worlds overlap. Um, thank you, you noticed. Um, and uh, I had a couple of questions lined up for each of these guys to spin off each other a little bit. And then we wanted to open it up to uh, any insights from the audience or questions that you have for these guys. So I'm going to start off by asking Andrea um, about sort of the common thread. Uh, there's something in your work and then of your practice which points a direction that your career, you decided your career should take, I, should, uh, I suppose. Learning happens through each of these pro uh, projects and benchmarks the, the next one as they come along. Can you talk a bit about either through process, through engagement, through engagement of, um, I suppose, practices and methods outside of traditional architecture, uh, of how you sew those together and how your work infor uh, is informed no matter where the place. Because your, the statements on your website, you very much believe in an architecture of place. But I guess I want to know a little bit about your process and how you ensure that um, each place that you work in is nourished. So often we've been, we've been called humanitarian architects. Uh, other, in other cases, we've been working, so we've been called uh, social architects. I do believe we're just architects here. And what we're trying to do, again, it's really like sometimes, is it better? It's actually not working well, but now, yeah? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can use that. Um, so we have, we have, um, <coughs> yeah, we be, I, I just believe we, what we need to do is bringing, uh, or what we do is bringing architectural values in any type of projects. Uh, in London, of course, it's much easier. And I was the same in the presentation in, in 80, we really, really struggle at the beginning. It's still today, it's like, situation has improved. Uh, we provided, we, I say we, but like the, there were many ar other architects in 80. We provided the, loc the local organization, the international organization, and all the actors involved in the reconstruction, almost with an education of what the transformative power of architecture could do in this kind of context. And I think it's quite important, as architects as well, to look at the wider pictures. I was saying, like, how is it quite important to work within on the neighborhood scale, but also be able to start looking at the, the wider scale as the city scale, and how we actually connecting the dots. It's like, why these architectural projects are not isolated, but is part of a wider system. 
I think it's that going between the personal level and the neighbourhood, the different territories as we were talking about before. And I guess that's why I want to bring you and Derek as to um, TfL will shape enormous parts of the city that we sit in uh, and live in. What I found quite beautiful about the, the kind of sequence of Andrea's work was that often what you were finding was um, a kind of a disruptive organisation in an informal development which really brought focus, um, um, function, focus and, and kind of beauty for the, through those things. Do you feel in the work that TfL is going to do over the next however many years that there is that space for that kind of beautiful disruptivity in the uh, in the process and how how is the process going to allow for I guess these infrastructural interventions to, to tie neighborhoods together and kind of reach down from a city scale to quite a personal scale yeah so I think there there really are two pieces to that and the first part you know really warrants backing up a little bit and kind of explaining a bit about our, our program, which, uh, which Andrea touched on. Uh, the mayor has tasked us with uh, bringing forward a, a very significant amount of housing, um, so much so that within a couple of years we'll become one of the largest developers in London, uh, and that's going from a, a standing start. Um, so it's really quite a, quite a monumental program and something that TfL obviously hasn't done in the past. I mean, people think of us as a transport authority, and, and we certainly are. Um, that's our core business, but at the same time, we're also becoming a housing delivery provider, and we're delivering 50% of the homes uh, as affordable. So we're doing much more than the private sector ordinarily would bring forward uh, for affordability. And what that does is it gives a really transformative uh, opportunity to to change the face of London and and do so in a a really new way um, because we have that infrastructure component and the ability to shape infrastructure and transport we actually have the opportunity to create what I think will be the very, very first generation of truly transport-oriented developments. Because historically the issue has been that the transport authority develops the transport and developers come and build around it. And, and what we're able to do is take a much more integrated approach where we actually bring the two together and kind of seamlessly marry them uh, at the neighborhood level. And, and you know, ultimately what we're trying to do here is to generate and deliver a new generation of town centers. And I think, you know, to your, your question a little bit more directly, um, in terms of how we actually stitch those neighborhoods together and, and actually bring that down to the, the individual and personal level, um, we've actually had a fairly radical um, rethink uh, in the most recent transport strategy, and I, I have to give credit to, to Lucy Saunders on that one. Uh, she ended up developing the Healthy Streets approach, which if you aren't familiar, I'd encourage you to, uh, to take a look at. It's um, actually being replicated globally now because what it does is it completely rethinks what public transport is. I mean, the kind of spaces that Andre is talking about, that is public transport in, the, in this kind of a model. Because we're not talking about transport infrastructure, we're talking about mobility ultimately. And if we can provide mobility at that neighborhood scale, if we can make it feasible for people to walk and cycle instead of take public transport, make public transport feasible instead of driving, we facilitate that modal shift. Suddenly we're talking about neighborhood scale interaction, neighborhood scale mobility, uh, rather than having to commute large distances across the city. And that's really a very different model from the TFL of the past. Um, and I think it's gonna be in combination with our housing program, quite transformative for the city. Has anyone got a good question yet? One at the front. will be the judge. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, it's super duper interesting. Um, I'd love to know more about your research methods and how you actually engage with your communities and how that differed and what you did to overcome any issues. It's like you read my notes. Because mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> one of the things that came through very strongly was the... Um, the engagement, the way you went about engaging, whether you were able to or not. And I was going to tack something onto the end of that about particularly the social and cultural measures that you might have looked for. Everyone wants everything to be measurable now, right? And whether you've had the chance to take any kind of post-occupancy evaluation of whether anything that you thought of or came through community engagement has 
lived or died or, or, or become a resounding success accidentally? Um, so we start community engagement normally at the very beginning. Um, when we started the project in, of Tapis Rouge, uh, the client, uh, which was uh, Global Communities, the implementation partner for the old uh, Lamica program, came to us and asked, can you design a public space? I was like, sure, that's great, sounds interesting. Um, can I have the brief? I was like, oh, there is no brief. So we asked uh, very kindly, can we actually meet the community? Because we really felt the need to understand where the issues were and uh, what the aspirations also were. So what we, we have done before actually meeting the community, we have done a bit of research. It's nothing, nothing particularly complicated. It can be applied in any type of context. We're actually doing right here, right now for the project in Tensmead. We observe, we are architects. If there is one good thing that we're good at, is observing. So we sit down on benches and we just observe um, or we walk around the neighborhood. We observe what we call the events, which are existing um, spaces. Uh, even if they're very crowded or very narrow, very small, people still use the public space. And then we start observing how this, all these events, and it could be like a few people sitting under the, the trees, um, under the shade of a mango tree, playing domino, rather than kids uh, flying kites on the rooftops of, uh, of houses, and all these kind of things that inform the design process. Then we meet the community. Uh, it's not just us, it's always like we've been assisted by community agents of the organization working in their specific neighbors. They already have a relationship with, with the community. And then basically what we do is like, the first thing I say to a community is like, I'm supposed to be the expert providing the design and understanding and put together all the ideas on, on paper and then on a built reality. You are the expert from the site because in a context like that, you can go to the city hall and looking for maps of underground conditions, underground service, but it's very difficult to find it. So the only people that actually they can tell uh, about uh, existing sewage or what the problem with the drainage are, are the people from the community. So they are the site experts. So we establish this uh, strong relationship with the community. We are expert, you are expert too. That's the kind of logic. And then it continues through the uh, design process, through the construction. Um, sometimes people don't quite understand plans or sections, so we bring like literally a, a Rhino model onto the community engagement and we show basically around. Uh, we have like a kind of like a flu, uh, a fly through uh, model showing the, the design and the, um, and the solution, the design solutions. Uh, and during construction is all a different set of challenges. Like we've been engaging in more formal, once every two weeks, more formal engagement uh, sessions, or literally we have like informal chats with the members of the community on a daily basis and say, oh, this is great, this is a great color. Oh, you, oh, you can build these stairs here because I know my neighbor in few, in few, in few months' times when he has the money available, he's going to start building his house. So that will prevent him from actually building it. And then during the cons um, once construction is done, we, we did post occupancy evaluation. Again, I said it was, a, it was a very slow process, which was intentionally so, also because it wasn't paid, but besides that. Um, it was actually quite interesting to understand. It in, in, in needs to take the proper time. We planted eight flamboyant, which is a beautiful trees, uh, tree with uh, red uh, flowers. Uh, it takes about good two to three years to actually grow and provide shade. So we wanted to wait that amount of time to see how the space, uh, the public space behave also during the day because we, we knew at night after the dusk, after dusk uh, with the street lights um, working, the place was actually popular and it is. But now that the, the, the trees provide enough shade, it's actually well used during the day. How much of that can come to impact the developments that you're going to look at? Um, you know, I think community engagement is, is a massive, massive deal and something that we, you know, as TFL, I think have gotten better over time at. Um, but it's something that, that public sector authorities generally haven't been all that great at. I mean, 
it's really challenging, and I, I think we need to be upfront about that to engage communities when you are delivering a mega infrastructure project. I mean, that's just the reality. Um, you've got so many people to consult and so many people to, uh, to engage with that, you know, the, the methods by which you engage suddenly become really quite critical. I mean, if, if, if you send out mailers, for example, like the, the typical approach is to everybody who's living in the neighborhood and say, there is a new infrastructure project potentially coming through your neighborhood, what do you think of it? you're not going to get millennials showing up to those community engagements. They're not going to be sending mail back. Uh, you get a very specific cross-section of respondents. And, and what that does is it really limits the debate, limits the discussion, and it provides a very um, skewed view, I think, of what the actual community sentiment is. And as a result, um, when that infrastructure eventually does come through, it doesn't necessarily reflect what the community is looking for. And I think branching out uh, into different media and actually doing consultation in a very different way, um, trying to reach people not just during the day, not just you know notifying them via mail, but actually taking it to many different platforms, making it much more accessible and, and kind of democratic in a way, I think is the first key part. And the second key part is to actually engage the community before you've actually come up with a design. Um, one of the biggest issues that I've found is that the, the engagement process is inherently reactive. You're taking a fully formed proposal to the community and saying, what do you think of this? And, and really it kind of needs to work the other way around where you're saying, okay, you as the community, what do you need and how do we deliver that? And, and fundamentally, I think that's what makes Andrea's approach um, really quite unique uh, and why his projects really do stand out is because he takes that community first approach and he doesn't even start designing until he understands fully what the community actually wants. And you don't see that, generally speaking, in, in a lot of practices. You know, as you said, you generally get a brief as an architect, you design it up and then you see what happens. And, you know, I think that increasingly, especially as we do these development projects in, in communities uh, around transport nodes where it's going to impact and be visible to a, a very large number of people, it's going to be really quite key to make sure we're accurately capturing that sentiment and, and doing so in advance of actually designing up and, and delivering proposals. There we go. There's a hand. Um, I realize in one of, uh, one of the slides in your presentation you've put like a brief picture of the St. Pancras uh, Granary Square steps and I go to Central St. Martin's and I see how like how crowded it gets and one of the things that I observe is that it's a, public, uh, it's a privately owned public space so you have security all the time telling people you can't lay down for a certain amount of time, you have to, you can't drink, you can't do this, you can't do that and obviously it's easy to maintain a space like that when you have somebody looking after it but I have, I am from Syria, I've been to places where you know there's public space that has been misused or you have some people that go there and kind of trash it out and stuff like that. How do you limit that? Do you have some people, do you allocate some people from the community to look after the space? Do you kind of have rules? Or do you just kind of expect and hope to go well? To hope? I mean, you can have plans and research, but how do you kind of forecast what's going to happen in that space? Um, thank you. <clears throat> um, so, yes, we have hope. Uh, we have uh, discussed over and over again uh, in, the, in the community, in the communities where we work with, um, about trash. Trash is maybe the most difficult thing to solve in an informal neighborhood. Nobody came up with solutions, like durable and sustainable solution yet. So we have designed actually a uh, We have designed trash bins. Uh, they've constructed it, and then with the um, uh, with the American Red Cross, we decided not to place anyone because we saw few of them were installed in other uh, alleyways, etc. What we saw is that people were bringing their home trash into the, those bins, so they were filled up immediately, and uh, and it was not a sustainable model. We w didn't want to, the public space to be completely covered with trash, so that's why we work a lot. On the on place making, community engagement, creating even creating this mural was actually part of the process. Uh, Eighty uh, a couple of years ago went through a very painful electoral process, and during election, uh, which lasted a year, 
um, during elections, all the walls of every building around the country is completely wrapped up with electoral posts. And what we saw, that the, the mural was actually done right before the elections, and what we saw, the few people tried to stick uh, electoral posts on the wall, some of the people from the community took it out. And for me, it was like showing like the people own the place, own the wall, own the, uh, even if, if they were very opinionated, and that, in general, what we understood, because we tried to, uh, during the post-occupancy evaluation, try to understand how this committee of a few people get to the place twice a week and collect the trash. What we, what we understood from the, from the focus group that we ran during the evaluation is that actually people are much more educated. Actually, the, the natural instinct in AT, if you're in a public sp space, is that dropping like everything that you have in your hand. So, and they don't do that in Tapi Rouge, which is pretty fascinating. And regarding the space in, the, um, in front of the Semart in, in front of the Semart in Granary Square, I picked the pictures not particularly because I like it. I know it's a private space. The old development, there is no real public space. It's more, mostly like privately owned by Argent. I think they are quite we need to face that. There are a lot of uh, accessible places that are actually privately owned. It depends where the rule is. It's like if you have cameras everywhere, and again, if you have people to tell you what to do and not to do, that could become annoying. But this is actually not a bad example. There are much worse. I've seen much worse than that, actually. Any other question? What did I do? Sorry. for your inspiring projects. I was just wondering, how did you, um, how are you making your practice like financially viable? And how many years did you have to volunteer and do the work you did before you got paid? <laughs> um, I actually never volunteered. Um, we started the company because we had paid projects uh, at the very beginning. It was actually funny because that project in Tapiruji was kind of like our kickoff project, our pilot project, and um, it, it, it came actually after, the day before I actually was uh, supposed to leave, 80 for good, after five years, after four years. So my, my bag was ready and I was ready to go. I received a phone call and we started from a small feasibility study that actually ended up led to uh, construction, the full design and construction. So I, um, in 80 it was really like a word of mouth. So we had, uh, it was very easy, we, it's like Port-au-Prince is now an enormous city, so it's three millions, so we had a li like a live portfolio, so we could bring uh, other organizations, potential clients, to the public space that we have designed, and uh, it was much easier back then. Now. 80, uh, the majority of international uh, funds are actually allocated for the Middle East on, and now they start being allocated for the Venezuelan uh, mi migration crisis. There are not mo much money left for 80, so it's, we are still taking, uh, we have a big public uh, uh, park project, so we still have a team of uh, three people in 80. And, and in London, what it was great, it was actually um, through this uh, framework of the Mayor of London, we really had the opportunity to, to get uh, two projects within the first six months since we signed the contract. It was actually run through TFL. <coughs> what he was fascinated about the ADA process, uh, besides uh, like an enormous amount of paperwork, uh, we had, sorry, uh, <laughs> and a very long, uh, <laughs> painful process of a year. Uh, we had to provide three examples of similar project in similar context. And look at my business part and I was like, we only have a portfolio of Asian projects, what do we do? I was like, okay, let's give it a try. And then we actually scored the first in our lot. And for me there was a, almost like a demonstration of we are actually in a moment of change. That at the other side of the table, there was a, definitely some people at the TFL office, at the mayor's office, they wanted to hear a new voice, not just to, to see a new face, but actually 
uh, experiment something new and try something new. And so this is like, uh, we, we do undertake a little bit of free work here and there to secure uh, some projects, but we try not to do that because we, I don't think it's a particularly sustainable model. Um, but what we would like to do is also, I was t telling Derek earlier today, we really want, would like to start a, a bigger research team, but it's quite difficult to find funds for that. It's quite difficult to find funds for post-occupancy evaluation. So how do we do that? That's a big challenge. Hello, back. Thank you for the very inspiring uh, presentation. Um, similar to, I'm an architectural legend, um, so similar to you, I had an existential crisis after working for a for a Latin, uh, Latin zone practice. I quit and uh, decided to do a charity work. I went to Gambia um, and uh, I raised my own funds. Um, and it took some time to do planning, but when I was there, I quickly realized um, how lucky I was to have partnered with the right people because it could have gone completely disastrous. Um, so I understand that you have you know, a representation to IT and uh, also Lebanon. Uh, but I'm wondering if you, um, you must have like, you know, partnered with local bodies, and, you know, individuals, or maybe, like, you know, organizations to help you know, channel your project over there. And, uh, you know, act as a design guardian to, to convey it uh, as the way you envisage. So um, would you be able to tell us more about your partnership uh, with the you know, sure. project uh, places? It is a critical aspect and I guess that's why TfL has so much paperwork so that you prove yourself as partners but it works differently in different places. Um, just to explain you a little bit of how um, international development uh, projects and or programs work. Normally there is a, a big donor, it could be in that case the American Red Cross, USAID or others. Um, they don't implement the work themselves, uh, so they, they run a bid and the successful uh, organization, in that case was Global Community, it's called the Implementation Partner, would then go look for uh, the different uh, consultants, engineers, architects, environmental engineers, and so on. Um, we've been lucky in some cases, we've been less lucky in, uh, in other projects. Uh, we don't really choose the partners, we choose the, the other consultants that we bring uh, that we bring, bring into the project, like the engineers. We've been working with the New York-based uh, environmental engineers, which has been really fantastic and very creative in the way we were actually combining, able to combine archi an architectural program with disaster risk reduction measure, measures. But in terms of um, the, the partners, like the, the implementation partners, it's more like our clients, so they choose us, really. So sometimes We've been very lucky, and for me, it always come down to the project manager working for the donor or for the implementation partner. It always comes down to like, if there are somebody who's actually caring about the project and they know they're creative in the way they procure things and they procure, they make things happen, it could change drastically from one project to another. To add to that and to focus this on you being a director of a practice, how do you pick your staff who are going to be representing you and the trajectory your practice has set very far away from you? How does that work? Um, in AT we had, uh, we had a team, uh, the busiest time, we, were, we had a team of eight people, all local, um, with one French uh, project manager. Uh, he was the one who was actually running the interviews uh, after I left the AT three years ago. Uh, in AT, the equivalent of Reba counts 17 architects. So it's quite difficult to find an architect, I would say. Um, so the majority of, uh, of the people working with us are actually engineers. And uh, we, they normally work on site eight hours a day. Uh, when the construction company starts at 7 a.m. 
and they are all they are on site every day all the time and that's uh, the majority. We have one architect uh, who's just nearly graduated who is working as, a, as an architecture assistant for the project manager who is also Asian. I keep getting further back. It's like the thoughts are transmitting. I start off by saying that you started your career asking what the role of the architect was to be in an operation in this disaster context. I was wondering if you got the answer to that. Yeah. Sorry, say the last part. Could I was wondering if you got the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, working on it. Uh, I'm working on answering that question. Uh, I don't have the answer yet. I think we are in a moment of uh, big change, not only from uh, from the local government here, but also from uh, within the architectural community. I think the the 2008 and ongoing crisis, uh, economic crisis, really put like uh, put us the old profession um, in into a very deep uh, rethinking of what our role is and it's not just in that those kind of contexts but it's also like a context like London. I think there are more and more architects that are exploring new type of services including community engagement for instance or um, providing uh, working with again I was saying earlier uh, combining disaster risk reduction uh, and addressing climate change within the scope of services. Uh, I think when we, in 10 years time, probably we're going to look back uh, at these past five years, that we really have changed, is a generational change in the architecture uh, community. But we need to wait for, to see that. So what is the role of architects? I don't know, I, I'm experimenting myself. So it's going to take a little while to, to answer this question. I'm going to be lazy and ask Derek what he thinks, through his eyes, the role of the architect or the wider design community is in infrastructure projects. But when you think about it in terms of infrastructure can have a permanence, but also a very temporal nature to it and the way it's used and the events and programmes that it can host, because it can be the glue between things in communities. So what's the role of the design community in TFL's world and in, in London, how are we going to see that come out in these projects? Well, I, uh, I think the design community has a, has a huge responsibility uh, to Londoners, uh, ultimately. And because of the kind of projects that we undertake and, and how long-lasting they can be, um, the architects that we choose to work with really can have a transformative impact. I mean, you, you look at the Holden stations, for example, and you see them all over London. They're immediately recognizable. You know when you're looking at one. And entire communities sprung up around those stations. I mean, th those stations fundamentally not only created a new design icon for London, they actually completely changed how the, the city functioned. And we're now moving into a new era of transport infrastructure. Um, you know, we talk about mobility, mobility as a service and the internet of, of things and automated vehicles. And suddenly, transport infrastructure as we've conventionally known it uh, is very, very different. The value proposition of transport is very, very different. And I think at the end of the day, you know, design is a, a core part of it. Um, design really, you know, is fundamentally at its core just trying to execute a brief and come up with something. But I think the role of the architects and, and you know, the lead designer is not so much to create a design that fulfills a brief or, or you know, meets certain objectives. It's really to actually re-envision what the city can look like, just like Holden did um, with his stations. I mean, we are doing radically new things and every single designer that we work with, I think it's incumbent upon them. And we actually made this very, very clear as part of the ADAP process that the architects we choose to work with, they have an opportunity to shape London 
as well as shape design. And, and that is really what I think their, their role is, is to fundamentally redefine what the 21st century city looks like. It's not just about the building or how it looks. Time for one last question. Someone must have an absolute spark of delight that they want to share. Come on. <coughs> really not. Come on. Right then. I think we shall thank uh, Marty and the staff at Article 25 for hosting this event. And I'm handing back over to you. And thank you all very much for um, attending. Please bring your questions to these guys up front and discuss amongst yourselves what you've seen tonight. Thank you.